Okay, so tonight we have Carolyn Joyce. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and then she's going to come up and speak. She is one of only a handful of U.S. women to ever compete at three Olympic Games. It's pretty impressive. Kara is the only swimmer in the NCAA college swimming history to win the 50 and the 100 freestyle all four years in a row. She is an 18-time NCAA champion and the second most decorated collegiate athlete in history for any sport. In 2017, Kara founded the LEAD Sports Summit for Teenage Girls, an organization dedicated to the empowerment and development of young women in sport. Let's give a big round of applause for Carolyn Joyce. Hello. I'm a little bit taller than you. Here. I'll just take it out. I like that. I brought two of my Olympic medals um, to share with you guys tonight. And who was at the movie last night? Raise your hand if you... Okay, so some of you have already heard a little bit of spiel about this, but um, I brought two of my medals. This one right here is from the Athens Olympics in 2004, um, which about half of this crowd was born before 2004, so that's good. Um, and this one with the red ribbon is from the Beijing Olympics in 2008. So something that I think is really cool about the Summer Olympics is the front of the medals are always the same for the Summer Olympics. It's the Greek goddess Nike, which is the goddess of victory. And then the back of the medal, the ribbon on the medal, all of that is designed by the host country. So that's what makes it really unique and special to each host country. And for Athens, they put the beginning of the Olympic anthem in Greek on the back of their medal. Um, 2004 was the first time the Olympics returned to Greece, so that was kind of cool. And all of their colors, bright blues, pinks, greens, um, it was like a big celebration there. And then Greece put, uh, I'm sorry, Beijing put a ring of jade on the back of their medal. So when you see it, you'll see it's kind of heavy because it's got this rock in it. Um, jade, I have found out, is very fragile. And um, I was at an event and uh, this little kid picked up my Athens medal and accidentally dropped it on my Beijing medal and it cracked the jade. So I'm going to pass these around for you guys all to see and you can hold them and you can try them on and you can take pictures. Just be very careful. Okay? No dropping. You first. So thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, working with the team here has been so much fun um, the last two days. I think we've learned a lot. We've definitely had a good time. And to me, it's truly an honor to be somebody that's brought in to do something like this, to be somebody that's brought in to, to talk about swimming and to talk about my experience because it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting right where you guys are, listening to an Olympian and dreaming of their story. So it's, it's surreal, but it's, it's quite an honor. Um, so now I get to tell you guys a little bit about my story and why I'm standing here today. I grew up in upstate New York, so very far north, a lot colder, a lot more snow, and um, I have two older brothers, two brothers, and I'm the youngest, I'm the only girl. And so when I was uh, five years old, I came home from school and I was like, mom, all my friends are doing tumbling, I want to be a gymnast, can I please sign up? And my mom was like, Mm, Kara, both your brothers want to be on the swim team, uh, and the family has one car, so that car is going to go to the pool. <laughs> and being the only girl and the youngest, like, I'm very used to my vote counting for nothing, you know, nobody cares what I have to say, and so I got in the car, and I went to swim practice with my brothers. Um, even though it wasn't my first choice, I loved swimming. I loved the feeling of being in the water. I loved seeing my friends. I loved trying to race my brothers. Like, I loved everything about it. But with that being said, I was the worst swimmer on the team for quite a while. Um, and when I was seven years old, um, I watched the Olympics. It was my first introduction to the Olympics. Um, I was sitting on the bed of my mom, and I saw swimming on TV, and I was like, what is that? And she was like, oh, Kara, this this is the Olympics where the best swimmers in the world get to compete and race against each other for, you know, one Olympic champion. And I was like, I want to do that someday. I want to be an Olympian. And um, my, my mom turned to me and she was like, that's great, honey. Um, but, you know, Olympians can get from one side of the pool to the other without stopping. 
Maybe tonight you can try that in practice. I was on a two year journey to make my full 25. And uh, so that night, I went to practice, made the whole 25 without stopping, and I was like, I'm going to the Olympics. My mom said I have to go whole 25, and that's what I have to do. Um, it doesn't really work like that. But in watching that, that Olympics, it changed everything for me. It completely changed my perspective on, on what sports can do and where they can take you. And there was one swimmer in particular that I just loved. And um, she won a gold medal in the tuner butterfly. Her name was Summer Sanders. And I think like Summer Sanders was like the, she was like the Missy Franklin of that Olympics. Or, you know, she was just like America's sweetheart. And I was like, mom, I just want to go to the Olympics like Summer Sanders. So little by little, I started to improve. I started to get a little bit better. And, um, you know, chasing my brothers up and down the pool every day helped me to improve. I think it also instilled um, a very deep-rooted competitive nature. Maybe that's just the nature of having siblings. Um, but I became so competitive and I loved racing. And nothing makes your older siblings more mad when, than when the younger one like, starts to come up and beat them, So especially if it's a girl. Um, so I love that even more. And um, when I was 14 years old, I qualified for the Olympic trials. And you guys think, you know, like two day meets, three day meets are long. Oh man, Olympic trials is like seven days long. It's the longest meet you'll, you'll ever experience. And I qualified in just one event. I made it in my very best event, which is the 50 free. On a seven day swim meet, you would hope the 50 free would come towards the beginning. No, it's on the last day. So my very first time on an airplane, um, we flew from New York to Indianapolis for Olympic trials. And I got to the meet and I checked in and I went out to the pool deck and there was just like Olympic legends walking around like they were normal people, you know, like Jenny Thompson and Lenny Kreiselberg and I think Michael Phelps was like 15 at the time. But all these people that I'd only ever seen on TV walking around like they're normal. And for six days, I sat and I watched this swim meet. And it was so agonizing. You know, day one, I'm sitting on the bleachers, watching everybody race, day two, day three, day four, just waiting for my chance to swim. So finally, day seven comes, and the women's 50 free, finally my chance to swim. So I get myself warmed up, I put on my racing suit, I put on my cap, I put on my goggles, extra, extra tight, because it's Olympic trials, and I sit down on the bleachers, and I start to try to get ready. And my coach comes over to me and she was like, you don't look so good. You're like kind of green in the face. And I looked up at her and I was like, I'm fine. I'm just gonna throw up really quick and then I'm gonna feel ready to go. And she was like, okay, Kara, do not throw up. And she actually said something that, that really helped me. She was like, look, I know that you've been sitting here for six days. I know that every single day you've seen something amazing happen. And I did. Every, every day at, at this swim meet that I was at, somebody broke a world record, somebody broke an American record, people qualified for the Olympics, and the longer the meet had gone on, the more I felt like I didn't belong. And she was like, I know something amazing has been happening every day, but you earned your spot here just as much as everybody else. You belong here just as much as they do. It doesn't matter if they have a faster seed time, if they're a couple years older, if they're a little bit taller, it doesn't matter. And the only thing that you should worry about, the only thing that you should focus your energy on is what's going on between your two lane lines because that is all you can control. You can't control what other people do. If they swim faster than you, if they swim slower than you, if they, like nothing that they do is under your control, so don't take your energy and give it to them. And the more she started telling me this, it, it actually relaxed me, I was like, you're right, like why am I so worried about everybody else? So she made me take these really deep breaths over and over again and it's something that I, I started to do before all my races and it, I felt good. I was like, my coach is right, my two lane lines, that's all I'm gonna focus on, I'm ready to go. So I get on the blocks, I swim my 50 free, kicking and pulling as hard as I can and I reach for the wall and I look up what place do you have to get to make the Olympics? First or second, what place do you think I get? No. Second, second, 
No. No, I didn't get third. Not A's. No. 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 Close. 75th place. 75th out of 76 swimmers. And the girl that was 76 was disqualified for a false start. So I was literally the slowest person in the entire event. And I got out of the water and I was like, how did this happen? Like, I'm so embarrassed. Everybody back home, my small town in upstate New York, everybody back home was cheering for me. They were all on the news with posters like, go Kara, you can make the Olympics. We're all cheering for you, woo! My brothers were gonna make fun of me for the rest of my life. Like everyone was gonna know I just got 75th place. So I went to the locker room, sat down crying, like I should probably quit, this is terrible. My coach walks in and she was like, we don't have to talk about that race right now. We'll just put that aside for now, but um, I want you to come out to the pool deck and meet somebody. And I'm like, I don't wanna meet anybody. And she's like, come out to the pool deck and meet somebody. And I was like, okay. So I walk out to the pool deck and I'm like shuffling my feet, looking down, and I see these feet that don't move as I'm walking, and I, I look up, and I look up further and further, and this woman's looking down at me, and she's like, are you Carolyn Joyce? And I'm like, yeah, yes. And as soon as she says my name, I know who she is. She's like, I'm Summer Sanders. It's so nice to meet you, why are you crying? And so then I start crying harder, because it's my hero, uh, first of all, and she knows my name, second of all. And so I explained my whole story. I just you know, sat through six days of Olympic trials. I finally did my race. I was supposed to get first or second. Instead, I got 75th. And she was like, okay, okay, sit down next to me. So I sat down next to her and she put her arm around me and she was like, Kara, you should be proud. You're at Olympic trials. That's a big deal. Don't worry about not making it. And she's like, I didn't make it at my first Olympic trials either. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, I swam the 100 fly and I got third. And I was like, yeah, same, same. <laughs> she was like, you know what? You go home and you work hard for four more years. Every day you go to practice carrot, you give it an honest effort. When you come back, you're gonna be taller, you're gonna be stronger, you're gonna be faster. That's gonna be your time. And my dad is from New York City. He's got this really, really thick New York accent. And so Summer's like explaining all this stuff to me and then up in the stands behind me I hear, Kara, Kara, turn around, Kara. And I like, turn around and my dad's waving at me and I'm like, Dad, not right now. And he takes out his, uh, his uh, disposable camera. And he's like, I wanna get a picture. And so I'm like, oh, um, Summer Sanders, can I get a picture with you? And we both turn around. My dad winds up his camera, you guys don't know what I'm talking about, and snaps a photo. And so, you know, I, I left Olympic trials, um, went home, went straight to CVS to the one hour photo develop so I could get my picture with Summer Sanders. And I got it back and I looked at it and I was like, man, my face is red, tears streaming down my cheeks, it's not coming out of my nose. But I'm with Summer Sanders, this is so cool. And I put it on my bulletin board and I saw it every single day and for four years I thought about, Kara, go to practice and give it an honest effort. And whatever your dream is, if your dream is to make the Olympics, if your dream is to compete in college, if your dream is to go to state meet, whatever it is, it just takes an honest effort and it takes consistency. And just because I'm an Olympian doesn't mean that I went to practice every day and had these like Olympic level practices. No. Some days you go to practice and you really surprise yourself. You're like, wow, I've never made that interval before. Or, I've never done a 200 fly before. Or, you know, maybe you go best time in practice. Other days you go to practice and you're going last in the lane. You can barely make the interval. Your shoulders are killing you. Everything hurts. But you showed up and you gave it the honest effort. And all of those efforts, all of those honest efforts, the days that feel good and the days that don't feel good, all add up. So four years later, I went back to Olympic trials. I walked in, I was taller, I was stronger, I was faster, and I was like, you know what? I know this meet is seven days long. I know that my best event comes on the last day. I know every day there's gonna be amazing things happening, but I'm gonna worry about what's in between my two lane lines. That's where my energy's gonna go. And the first event that I swam was the 100 freestyle and I got first place. I made the Olympics when I was 18. And when you make the Olympics in the 100 free, you actually make it in three events because you get to swim the 400 freestyle and the 400 medley relay in addition to the individual 100 free. So 
Um, that was a big ticket. My dad was like, you know, if we're going to spend all this money to go to Greece and she's only got a 50 free, no dad, I made three events so you can come to Greece. So um, a couple days after the 100 free, I swam the 50 free and I got second. So I ended up making four events at my first Olympics. I had to get a passport, I had to go to Greece, and <laughs> you know, at 18 years old, your parents don't go to the Olympics with you. Like you go as a part of Team USA, they go separately. And I was like so eager to get on the plane. I was like, bye. And they were like, don't lose, like, don't lose stuff. Can you make sure you call us? And I'm like, yeah, bye, 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 bye. Got there, lost my passport, lost my cell phone, lost my luggage, lost everything I could have lost. You know, 18, first time really out of the country. Um, but somehow I managed to show up behind the blocks when it was my time to race. <laughs> Thank goodness. And um, I brought home two silver medals from the 2004 Olympics, one of them at that you'll see tonight, and um, I brought home two fifth place finishes individually, and I went all best times. After that, I decided the Olympics were the coolest thing ever, and I wanted to go back, and I worked really hard for another four years, um, attended college at the University of Georgia, had an incredible college experience. I absolutely loved college swimming, and in 2008, I was very fortunate to qualify for the Olympics again. I went to Beijing, and I brought home two more silvers and a sixth place finish. Again, I went all best times, um, so happy with it. After that, I was 22 and I was like, well shoot, what does one do when they are 22 and they've done the thing that they've always wanted to do their whole life? Like, what do I do now? And just like all of you guys that are training, all of you guys that are swimming, you have this, like, you have this fire and it's like, it's burning inside of you and you don't know how good you're gonna be and you wanna feed that fire and that's why you go to practice, that's why you go to meets and you work hard and you race because you don't know what your limit is and you're trying to test that. And at 22, I still felt that fire. I was like, I think I can be better. I think I still have something left in me. And at the time, um, there was only, I think, four or five women that had ever competed in three Olympic games. And I was like, I'll be darned, I'm gonna be number six. And the journey from 2008 to 2012, from 22 to 26 years old, wasn't easy. Um, as you get older, I, I look back, I'm like, oh, that's so old, not really. Um, but as you get older, your body does not recover the way it once did. You know, even from ages of 18 to 22, it starts to change. And, you know, I struggled with back injuries. I struggled with finding the right program to train an old lady. I struggled with a lot of different things. Um, but in 2012, I, I showed up to Olympic trials. And I walked in and I was like, okay, seven days, best event is on the last day, focus on my two lane lines, let's see how this goes. The first event that I swam was the 100 freestyle and I got 22nd place. Not really how I wanted to start out the meet, it's an event that I've won at that meet before and I got 22nd. And I went back to my hotel and I was like, okay. Not ideal, but also, I've been swimming long enough and I know that one bad swim is not gonna determine how the rest of my meet goes. One bad swim is one bad swim and it's over. And I have the ability right now to turn that around. So a couple days later, I swam my 50 free and I qualified for semifinals, top 16. I swam semifinals and I qualified for finals, top eight. And the next day, I got the opportunity to swim in finals. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced um, the ready room at swim meets, but as you make bigger and higher level swim meets, they like to put you in this thing that they call the ready room. And so they put all eight of you, they like shove eight people basically, like horses, like in a cage getting ready to race in this tiny little dark room. And they're like, okay, y'all sit here for 10 minutes and try not to kill each other before the race. Um, ready room is an interesting place and, you know, in a long course pool, most of the races are done at the starting end. When you swim at 50 free though, you're at the far end, but that's where you start and you swim into the finish. And so, um, at Olympic trials, the ready room was like a janitor's closet and there's like brooms and mops and like the light bulb was flickering. And this is where you sit right before you walk out on TV behind your lanes to race. So, sat down in the ready room with the other seven women and I was like, Man, I can't believe I have to do a 50 free on national television. This is crazy. I can't believe that I've been struggling with a back injury for the last four years. I can't believe I didn't have the right coach for a while. I didn't feel like I was getting the right training. All of the things that had gone wrong started going through my head. And it was like, like a record scratching. I was like, what am I doing? 
I'm, I'm thinking of all the reasons that I'm not gonna succeed right now. And if I feed myself that, I know what the outcome is gonna be. But I've also been swimming long enough that I know uh, the only way that this is gonna go well, the only way I'm gonna get something good out of this is if I believe in myself. That's where it starts. It doesn't matter if everybody else in the world believes me. If I don't believe in myself, this is not gonna go well. Not only that, I have to think positive. Thinking negative is only gonna fuel a negative outcome. And so I'm like, okay, Kara, positive thoughts, positive thoughts, what do you got, what do you got? And I was like, man, how did I even get here? And so I, I like, thought really hard and I was like, oh yeah, I was seven years old and, and I sat on the bed watching the Olympics with my mom and I said, mom, someday I wanna be an Olympic swimmer. And I was in fourth grade and I stood in front of my class with a giant poster board and I said, when I grow up, I'm gonna be an Olympic swimmer. And I got out of bed at five o'clock in the morning to jump into an ice cold pool and pushed my body until my lungs burned and my muscles ached because I wanted to be an Olympic swimmer. And all of these thoughts, all of these memories from years flooded my mind and I was like, that's why I'm here. I've worked so hard for this opportunity. I've worked hard just to get this opportunity. I owe it to that little girl, that seven year old girl, I owe it to her to give it my best effort. To be honest, I thought my very best effort was good enough for fourth place. Fourth place doesn't get you on the Olympic team, but I thought that I could get fourth place and I was gonna be really proud of myself and drive off into the sunset and retire. So I feel really good. I feel, you know, you worked hard for this, Kara. You owe yourself this moment. Just make it your best race. It's a 50 free, come on. So I got on the blocks and I dove in. Swam my 50 free, kicking and pulling as hard as I could down the pool. And I touched the wall and I looked up and I got second place and I made my third Olympic team. And that race in particular, um, I didn't go a best time. I went 24-7, my best time was 24-5. I didn't get first place, right, I got second. I didn't break a record. I didn't do a lot of things that I had done previously in my career. But that swim is my favorite swim of my entire career because I changed the outcome of that race before it even started. And I think it's so important for you guys to understand that it doesn't matter what everyone around you thinks. It only matters what you believe. And if you work hard and you show up and you give it the honest effort, you owe it to yourself. You owe it only to yourself to let those results come through. So after the London Olympics, I, I actually officially did retire and um, I started the Lead Sports Summit. Um, and the Lead Sports Summit is for teenage girl swimmers. And it's a four day summit. Um, we host it once a year, it's in Atlanta, Georgia. And we empower young girls. We bring in six female Olympic champions. We bring in a nutritionist, a confidence coach, a sports psychologist, a leadership specialist. And uh, we have a lot of fun. And it's coming up in like three weeks. So I'm like not sleeping right now, I'm getting excited. But we have 126 girls coming. And, and that's really, uh, that's the greatest gift, I think. You know, I, I always say that the best gift that swimming gave me, it's, it's not the records, it's not the medals, um, it's the people the amazing people that you get to meet along the way. And for me now, like I get to meet a whole new crop of people every single year and um, hopefully have an impact on their lives. So that's the greatest gift of all. Um, but that's kind of my story. That's how I got here today. And if you wanna hear more about it or watch more about it, um, those of you that weren't at the movie last night, um, there's a documentary that came out and it's called Touch the Wall. And it's on uh, iTunes, I think and somewhere. If you Google Touch the Wall, you'll find it. Um, but it's a documentary that follows my journey alongside Missy Franklin to the 2012 Olympics. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to open it up to questions today. Parents, swimmers, neighbors, anything you guys have ever wanted to ask an Olympic swimmer, today's your chance. So thank you. Amanda. Did I prefer relays or individual events? Good question. Um, so not everybody gets to swim a relay. It's like a huge honor to get to swim on a Team USA relay. And uh, 
I want to say, I don't know, relays are just so special. There's, everyone's like, man, I want this crazy fast relay split. And it's like, yeah, because you weren't swimming for yourself, you were swimming for other people. And so that has this ability to bring something extra out of you. And the very first medal I won was um, night, night one of the Olympics. So relays are swum at the Olympics prelims and finals. But if you finish top two at Olympic trials, you're automatically granted access to the finals relay. So you don't even swim prelims. So at 18 years old, my first race in the Olympics was finals, leading off the relay. And I remember we were standing in the ready room. The ready room was a lot nicer at the Olympics. And um, I'm with my relay teammates and all the other countries and stuff. And I opened the door to the ready room and I peek out into the pool area. And then I slammed it shut and I was like, you guys, don't look out there. There's a lot of people in the stands. <laughs> and one of my relay teammates, um, her name was Jenny Thompson, like most decorated female Olympian of all time. She was like, yeah, Kara, there's a lot of people out there, like 20,000. I was like, oh my gosh, 20,000 people. And she's like, yeah, and there's a billion people watching at home around the world. <laughs> I was like, huh. She's like, yeah, but don't worry, you know, just swim your race. Um, but we weren't even favored to win a medal on that relay, and so we got a silver, and it was pretty incredible. So I, I would favor the relays, I think. What's your 200 fly story? <laughs> My 200 fly story. Uh, I told you it's not that good of a story. All right. We had a couple people volunteer to do a 200 butterfly today. I was very impressed. Um, so, like I said, I was a 50 freestyler. And um, it was always, you know, from the time I was 14, 50 free was my best event. But that being said, I trained distance most of my career. I wasn't like one of the lucky sprinters that got to swim in sprint lane. I trained for distance. And all through college, I swam the 500, I swam the 400 IM, I did the 200 back. Whatever my team needed me to swim, I would swim. However, I swam for 21 years, many different teams and coaches and programs, and one of my proudest accomplishments in swimming is that I never did a 200 butterfly. <laughs> That's my 200 butterfly story. And the secret is, you don't tell anybody that you've never done a 200 butterfly. Like, I couldn't believe the day I retired, I was like, this is amazing. So, I never told a coach that I hadn't done it. Any new program that I was at, I was like, zip. But I think they all saw me finish a 100 fly and were like, ugh, like, I, don't, I don't even want to see a 200 fly. Um, so, everybody that did it today, I've actually never done that. <laughs> Because I was terrified. I've never seen that many people at a swim meet before. And I was like, you guys, there's a lot. Of, you don't want to go out there. <laughs> and she was like, actually, we do. And there's a billion people at home. And there literally is a, a billion people around the world watching the Olympics. It's amazing. Yeah. Did you ever go to the Junior Olympics? I did. I competed at the Junior Olympics um, many, many times. And. Um, Every big meet that I qualified for, like I said, when I started, I was the worst swimmer on the team. Two years to go a full 25. And eventually I made um, like silver JOs or district or something. And then I made gold and then I made zones and then I made sectionals and then I made junior nationals and then I made Olympic trials. And every single meet that I qualified for, every time I went a faster time, it felt like you know, I was looking at this really high ladder and the Olympics were at the very top of the ladder. But everything I did to, to get myself a little bit closer, it was like taking one step higher on the ladder. And even on days, especially the days that I didn't want to go to practice, but I went anyway, I was like, okay, Carrie, you got one step higher. And so I did. I competed in, in all the age group meets. Um, I'll tell you a story really quick. My very first zone meet, I was 10 years old, and I made it in the 100 breaststroke. I think I only made it in 100 breaststroke because our area was very weak in the women's 110-year-old breaststroke at the time. And uh, where I'm from, zones was in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And I swam my 100 breast, and I think I got like 22nd or 23rd place. And I was like, man, I don't think that's gonna get me to the Olympics someday. And um, later that day, my friends and I were at the meet and the announcer on the PA system was like, attention everybody, we have an Olympic swimmer signing autographs here at Zones. Her name is Anita Nall and she's at the far end of the pool. And my friends and I were like, oh, an Olympic swimmer, first Olympic swimmer I ever met. 
And so we run to the end of the pool and we're looking up at Anita Nall and she's looking down at us and she's like, hey guys, anybody have gum? And I was like, Anita Nall, my mom has gum. And I run to the other side of the pool into the stands. I'm like, mom, Anita Nall needs gum. And she like flips through her purse and pulls out like a 32 pack and she's trying to get one piece. And she, she's like, just give her all of it. Just give her all the gum. So I run back down the pool and I'm like, here, Anita Nall, here's the gum. And she signed my jacket, Anita Nall, thanks for the gum. And I got the jacket back and I was like, Anita, did you ever swim in zones? And she was like, yeah, I made zones. I think I went when I was like 10 years old and I swam the hundred breast. And I was like, what place did you get? And she was like, oh my gosh, I did terrible. I got like 22nd or 23rd place. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, I can still go to the Olympics. Finish the same as Anita Nall. But that was, <laughs> that was my first zones. Not my best. <laughs> Your brothers still want to race me? My brothers, yes. So, my brothers, um, they did not make the Olympics. <laughs> they did not make Olympic trials. They did not make nationals. Um, but they both swam Division I in college. And um, technically, their best times were faster than my best times. Um, so I can't say, like, oh, I'm faster than you guys. Um, but they were the best, like, supporters. Um, even my, my middle older brother, he's 18 months older than me, and we were opposites. Like, I loved going to practice. I loved working hard. I loved racing. He just wanted to go to meets. He couldn't care less about practice. Um, so he had to put up with me just, like, nipping at his heels all the time. Um, so even though my brothers didn't get as far as I did in swimming, they saved up their money every four years and came to my Olympics and were the loudest, craziest Americans in the stands um, every time. So my brothers are awesome. Um, I love them so much and they're my biggest supporters, but, and they didn't make fun of me for getting 75th place. <laughs> What would I do if I didn't go to the Olympics? Um, that's a good question. I, if I never swam, I'm not really sure. Um, Cause like, I probably would have done another sport. I mean, I walk around six feet tall, everybody assumes I play volleyball or basketball. So maybe I would have done something, some other sport or, um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. I've, I've just been swimming my whole life and it's been such a part of my identity and, and who I am. Um, maybe I would have been a lawyer. I like to argue, I don't really know. <laughs> Yes. When I qualified for the Olympics, did I cry? Yes. I bawled my eyes out. Um, as soon as I touched the wall and, and looked at the clock, it was like tears were like shooting out of my eyes. Um, and my parents cried and my grandparents cried and like everybody back, like uh, probably a thousand people in my greater network cried. Um, but the same thing, probably even more so the third time I made it in 2012, um, I cried like so hard. And, Something that was really touching, you know, in 2012, I was the second oldest person. There's 26 men and 26 women that make the Olympic team every four years. And I was the, the second oldest on the team. So there was only one girl older than me. And a lot of times, like, when you qualify for the Olympics and you're on these teams, it's people that you've known for a long time, that you've competed with on national teams. And on the very last day, on the very last night, the women's 50 free, when I made it, um, the entire Olympic team cried because um, everybody knew like how hard that journey was for me. So it is, it's really emotional, um, but it's amazing. Any other questions? Yeah? Were you scared the first time you met all the other people on the Olympic team? Was I scared when I met the people on the Olympic team? <laughs> oh man, do I know Michael Phelps? Yes. Do I know Missy Franklin? Yes. Um, those are usually questions that I get asked. So. What's the best way to explain this? Okay, so from Olympic trials until the Olympics, it's about four weeks. And as soon as Olympic trials are over, you start Team USA training camp. And at training camp, everyone is staying at the hotel together. Everyone's eating their meals together. Everyone's swimming together. And so you become a team just as much as you guys are a team here. And you get to know your teammates really, really well. And not only that, you're experiencing one of the most incredible, you know, life experiences that you'll ever have. And so it's like, not only are these people, do you like treat them like teammates and stuff, but they become so ingrained and, in, you know, a, a huge part of your life. And so um, my very best friends to this day are my Olympic teammates. 
and I've been to a dozen of their weddings, and they've been to mine, and um, it's, it's really cool. So the, the people that you meet, like, you meet the best and the coolest people. How many times a week do I practice? How old are you? Nine. So when I was your age, I swam um, probably four days a week. And as I got older and I got a little faster, um, practices got added on. And uh, I think my senior year of high school, I did six to eight practices a week. Sometimes I would do morning practice, but I'm not a morning person. Um, and then when I got to college, mornings were not optional, and we had nine practices a week. Um, so that was brutal. But um, it's just some, something that builds on gradually. And like I said, just because you know you've gone to the Olympics doesn't mean that you've like trained like an Olympian your whole life. You know, I grew up doing everything that my teammates did and everything that my coach told me to do. And um, little by little, it, it adds up. And I think that's something that's so important for you guys to understand. You know, people aren't born. Olympians, people aren't born uber successful. It's it's about just being consistent and and showing up when you don't want to show up and and showing up over and over and over again. And those small increments lead to something great over time. But I think we're so used to having like instant results and instant feedback, especially today with how much access we have to things. But but greatness just takes time and it takes showing up, and it takes consistency, and if you can do that, you can do really amazing things. What would you tell that seven-year-old, 14-year-old girl? First of all, stop crying, no. <laughs> um, what would I tell her? The seven-year-old, I would say, please dream big, and, and don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Um, and the 14-year-old, I would say, keep plugging away, but, you know, however old I was, whatever else I was going through in my life during my swimming career, I swam my absolute fastest when I was happiest, and that comes from having balance, and even though I didn't really do other sports, I, mean, I kind of tried other sports, but I was so bad, um, even though I didn't really do other sports, I think it's so important to have balance. And for me, you know, if I had a big exam or a big project to do, I didn't go to practice. You know, school came first, and that was part of balance. And if it was my best friend's um, birthday party or graduation party, I would skip practice to, to go to that because that's also an important life thing. And with all that being said, though, I still went to like 99.9% .9 of the practices that were ever, off, ever offered to me. But the important thing is that you know that there's more important things in life than swimming. Um, and if you, if you can enrich those other things and, and truly, you know, become like the, the strong, you know, uh, intelligent, empowered young person that you are and, and have all these different life things that enhance you, um, you will have that balance and, and everything will be better. Your, your grades will be better, your social interactions will be better, your times in swimming will be better. So um, I think that's something that, that also gets a little bit lost when people get so myopic on one thing, but, but we're really better at everything when we have that balance. So I think that's important. If, you didn't swim, what would you do? if I didn't swim, what I do? Yeah, I think I'd play volleyball or be a lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Did you have any other hobbies as a child, like dancing or something? Um, when I was little, I danced. Um, I did. My brothers had to come to my recitals, so I enjoyed that. And then um, I ran track when I was in uh, junior high, um, but I was a terrible runner. Um, they put me on high jump because I was the tallest. I could basically like fall over the bar. Um, and in my life, like ever, I've only broken two bones. I broke my finger and I broke my elbow. And both times I was like walking and I fell. So I'm like not coordinated on land. Um, so yeah, swimming it was. Um, but yeah, I, I, did, I did try other stuff. I tried soccer, I tried dance and, and things like that. But swimming is the only thing that really stuck. All right, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much. Such a privilege.